Hi, I'm Susan Swain, host of C-SPAN's Q&A, where we spend an hour with nonfiction writers and historians who add context to today's news. In this Q&A, you'll meet Elizabeth Becker talking about her new book, You Don't Belong Here, which tells the stories of three groundbreaking women journalists, Catherine Leroy, Kate Webb, and Frances Fitzgerald, whose award-winning work helped reframe the Vietnam War. Ms. Becker is a journalist who reported from Cambodia herself in the 1970s. Our conversation will begin in just a moment. Elizabeth Becker, your new book, your fourth, is titled You Don't Belong Here. What's the story you're telling? I'm telling the story of three amazing women who on their own went to Vietnam because women in those eras, in that era, were not um, considered capable. They were mostly in women's sections of newspapers. And these three women went on their own, arrived in Vietnam without jobs, without places to stay, without anything. And they were told, you don't belong here. We're going to have an opportunity to talk about a little bit about each of their lives and works in, Vien- in Southeast Asia. Uh, but what are their names? Catherine Lecroix, a French ph- uh, photojournalist, photographer. Frances Fitzgerald, an American reporter, long-form magazine. And Kate Webb, Australian combat reporter. Your subtitle makes the case, your subtitle is how three women rewrote the story of the war, makes the case that their work provided a counter-narrative to the kinds of news that the Pentagon was serving up to journalists and the public and more conventional coverage. Mm -hmm. How did they do that? They did it by, it's almost, it's interesting you said counter because it was enlarging. They, um, They certainly were out covering the combat, Kate and Katrine, but they enlarged what they reported on and what they photographed. And as outsiders, I think they didn't quite realize as they were going along how much they were changing. Uh, they made a more humane picture. They looked at the country deeper, the societies and cultures deeper. Um, Katrine, for instance, did not take photographs that were patriotic. She took humane, you saw the anguish, the fear, the determination in battle, and the fear, et cetera, in in civilians. Um, Frances Fitzgerald, who um, is known as Frankie, and I'm going to slip and sometimes call her Frankie, uh, she she really bored into the country. And, um, in fact, one of her colleagues said she puts the foreign in foreign correspondent because she took such a determined look at... The Vietnamese. She came from a very privileged background, so I think she was more um, taken aback and um, uh, uh, truly taken aback by the um, destruction of the country. She had no, never seen anything like that. And um, Kate, uh, she's a wire service reporter, which you know is doesn't mean as much nowadays, but in those days that was the fastest, the most re- required turnaround f- time. And she made, definitely made the um, her wire service stories ring with a human story. And again, she, she even took her vacations to cover the Vietnamese army because she didn't think the Vietnamese army was um, covered enough. So th- they did it by enlarging and by going a little deeper. By telling their stories, you're also telling us the story of the Vietnam War itself and how it was prosecuted by Presidents Johnson and Nixon, by their generals and by their advisors. Uh, You now have the advantage of looking back over Mm -hmm. a couple of decades on this. What is the story of the war that you want readers to know? I want them to know that um, if Frances Fitzgerald could write in 1966 the root problem of the war and why the United States was not going to win it, why did not the generals or the diplomats or the politicians know that? I want them to know that the United States, using new words, inherited the French war that the Vietnamese had fought against, and like the French, they lost. Um, I want us to see the cost of that huge mistake, of hanging in there with the destruction, the cost to... obviously to the Vietnamese, but also to the American society. It was the most divisive war we had since the Civil War, when we actually were fighting each other. And it sort of foreshadows what we now call the forever wars of the Middle East now in the 21st century. So this is a serious issue. I mean, these women 
as green and outsider as they were, they saw it. And I want the reader to finish the book and say, okay, now I understand the war. And I understand that these women could perceive these problems. What's happened to our country that we couldn't? We're going to, to talk about their individual stories, but let's set the stage a bit. So uh, we're 20 years after World War II, which mm. had extensive coverage and famous journalists covering yep. it. What were the rules by the Pentagon for covering the Vietnam War? The rules were un... They were, they were not real rules. The, the, the Pentagon was not following World War II rules, which prohibited women from covering on the battlefield. Um, required all journalists, males, covering on the battlefield to be dressed in uniform, to be part of a unit, and to be to have their copy censored. Certain things could go in and out. But because President Johnson did not want this to be perceived as an all-out war, more like a police action, at first there was no, essentially no rules. So journalists could go in, and we're talking the, the American war beginning in 65. The American journalists could go in, and if you could get a commander to agree to allow you to cover them, you'd get on the helicopter, or APC, or armored personnel carrier, or a truck. As one journalist said, it was like having a Eurorail card. And once you, you went and you stayed as long as you thought necessary to do the story, and then you went back to Saigon and filed, and maybe you went out to dinner. There was no embedding like we have now. There's no, there was no military censorship, per se. So it was probably the first and last uncensored American war. Now, the South Vietnamese had their censorship in, their, in the PTT, the Post and Telegraph. But, so it was, it, it was, for women, a gift. Because it was only because of this lack of codification, this openness, that women could get through what had been the biggest barrier as a war correspondent, that you were not allowed on the field. You know, we, we know and love Martha Gellhorn. Well, she, wasn't, she was not on the battlefield for most of World War II. She snuck on t to Normandy, um, bless her, but she was not combat because she wasn't allowed. Women were with the nurses, whereas Kate Webb and Catherine Lois were on that combat. What, did, did a journalist have to be credentialed, and who would yes. provide those credentials? Yes. The credentials came from the United States military, uh, press passes, and that was essentially to say that you were legitimate, that, you, that someone, someone was going to buy your work, and that it was a, uh, you were with an accredited um, company. So these women who arrived without jobs, they immediately had to have their accreditation letters. Now, uh, the French woman... Katrine and the American Francis Fitzgerald had already got letters saying that they would be interested in their work, therefore they could get their credentials right away. Kate Webb didn't, did, it was so out of it she didn't know she needed that, so she didn't have one, and it took her quite a while to get a, a letter, but that was, that was essentially the Euro card. Given the openness uh, for journalists to cover this, uh, in the mid-60s, do you have any estimate of how many journalists were on the scene, and were they mostly Americans? Um, there were, <clears throat> at, when Kate arrived, there were 1,000. And there are, there, um, there are now numbers that are a little dicey about how many. I mean, lots of people on the scene, but many didn't live there. Many were just coming through. Um, some were spouses. So it's, it's hard to really measure, but there, there is a, a bona fide list, and they're in the thousands. And um, they were European and Asian as well as American. American, of course, was the majority. But uh, I worked, when I was in Cambodia, I worked with very few um, Americans. There were uh, as many Europeans and Asians as there were Americans. And uh, overall, how many of them would have been women? This is a, that's a tough question, and I spent a lot of time not getting a good answer, because you can say, according to the Pentagon list, over the 10 years, there were close to 500 women reporters. But then you dig into the list, and they weren't reporters. They were office managers. They were girlfriends. They were spouses. Um, they, um, they were in and out, and a lot of them just needed uh, the card to get to the PX. So, um, and then some who were legitimate 
reporters somehow weren't on the list. So um, I did my guesstimate of maybe a couple dozen residential, full-time women out covering the war. How did you choose these three for your book? This, it turned out to be easier than I expected. The hard part was figuring out how I would write the book. But then once I sat down and said, okay, who are the three who not only broke the barrier, which was de rigueur, they had to be that, but who really stood out for changing how we see war? Now, Francis Fitzgerald wrote the book Fire in the Lake, no book before or since has won more awards, and she published that when she was 31 years old. This was the book that told the war from the, not only the American but the Vietnamese side. So that was a given. No, no one else came close, and her work during the war was amazing. Catherine Lois, well, first of all, for the first few years of the war, she was the only woman combat photographer. And um, just before she started... Uh, a woman who began in World War II, Dickie Chappelle, was there. And she was killed on the field within months after arriving. And after that, foot, the photo agencies and didn't want to have another woman because they were afraid of seeing another um, woman dead on the field. So Katrine had it to herself, and she used it to her advantage. Her photographs were stunning, she, so much so that she became the first woman to win the George Polk Award for Photography, and the first woman to win the Robert Capa Gold Medal Award. Now, anybody winning those in their first years would be amazing. For a woman in combat, it was a stunning. Now, her, the Robert Capa was combat in the Middle East, but it, it all built up. And then Kate, um, Australian, she was remarkable for um, being that combat reporter we've never had before. Where, as I said, women were not allowed with the U.S. military during World War II. And sure, and sub sometimes they would get in and out, certainly, and they would cover this, that, and the other. Kate spent years with the military, not the U.S. military and the South Vietnamese and later the Cambodian. She did so well that um, she was named the first the deputy and then the actual bureau chief of um, United Press International in Phnom Penh. I couldn't find a similar um, instance where a woman was put in that kind of role, reporting and managing a full-time bureau in, in a war zone. And it was a deadly war zone. How were the women accepted uh, by two different sets of people, the military that they were working with and the male reporters in the field? The military is almost easier to answer <laughs> because... Um, you know, back in Saigon, and, or even in Phnom Penh, the, the higher-uppers um, tended to, to be a little more paternalistic, not as welcoming of women. But once you get in the field, the soldiers all love the women. So um, that wasn't so much a problem. The problem was when <clears throat> General William Westmoreland, who was the, you know, the army, the military chief in Vietnam, he... He had no idea that, the, you know, this handful of women were out there in the battlefield. And once um, he went to inspect a unit and, and he saw a young woman there who he happened to know. Her name is um, Denby Fawcett, and she's from Hawaii, and she's writing for a, a Hawaiian newspaper. And he said, Denby, what are you doing here? And she said, covering this unit. And he said, how long have you been here? And she said, a few nights. He said, oh, nice to see you. His wife played tennis with her mother back in Honolulu. He went back to Saigon. He said, I can't believe it. There are women out on the battlefield. It had not reached the higher levels, just how much women had, had taken advantage of this opening. And um, it took Catherine Lawad, Denby, and a few other women to concoct a strategy to calm down the Pentagon and not reimpose that World War II ban. They succeeded. They did a few, um, you know, little window dressing compromises. But they succeeded. The ban was never reimposed, ever. Those young women on their own got rid of that ban. But they never told their story. At least it took 30 years before they told their story because they were afraid that if it came out what they were doing, 
now this is 66, 67, that the ban would be reimposed by somebody in Washington. So it was all on the down low. And that would, that's the case in so much of what these women achieved. They had to keep it quiet because, you know, somebody back in, um, in, in the United States might say something. Now, the men were a different story. And they're the ones who, more than their male colleagues, more than the others, said, you don't belong here. Because this is male terrain. Um, you, this is very early days of women's liberation when it was a joke to the men, ha, 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 you need women's liberation because you can't keep up with us. Uh, women uh, were, were not accepted per se. They were patronized. Um, they were gossiped about. And um, if they started to show that they were competitors, it, it could be a problem. And one of the, the stories I tell in the book... Um, I found, I, through a Freedom of Information Act request, I retrieved the personnel file of Catherine Lajoie because I, there's all kinds of this, that, the other. She was too pushy. She had coarse language. She made people mad, and she got mad, and, and then something, blah, blah, blah. Well, it turns out, behind her back, as she was doing so well, um, the head of Agence France Presse, which is the wire service for, uh, in the French language, he and some anonymous reporters, who I don't know the, all their names, were behind Katrine's back with some of the military spokesmen to take away her credentials. Now, this, there's no legitimate reason to do that. You, you only take away the credentials if you actually break a law like uh, you know, manipulate the black market or, or lie about your credentials. But they made up this, this category of not being... Um, uh, not being proper for the press corps, that she was somehow damaging the press corps. I, when I read that file, I couldn't believe it, what the lengths that they went to to try to get rid of her. Now, she fought back. Was it uh, be competitive in nature? Is that well, what was well, driving it? Well, you know, if the women are just to the side in their decoration and they're, you know, you know, you know oh, Susan, yeah, yeah, I know Susan, she's cool, but of course she's not ever going to be <laughs> the anchor on C-SPAN, you know, that sort of thing. Once you get into that position, then, of course, the misogyny comes out. Now, the men were competitive with each other, but nobody, I saw no attempt to go behind the back of any of the men. But for this, there's no question. And the words they used were very misogynist. So a little bit more on Catherine Leroy. Uh, it, your chapter, uh, first chapter on her is titled Petite Lady. <laughs> if, if, in fact, we could have her standing here today by us, what, what would we see? What, would you, what should she look like? Um, she looks like a sort of like an elf or a pixie. She's about f- barely five feet tall. Um, had a hard time keeping enough weight on to, to reach 90 pounds. Um, blondish. Uh, sp- oh, there she is, sparkling eyes, um, and um, acrobatic in sort of her whole manner, but with, you know, a, a lovely French overlay. Did her small size work to her advantage and sometimes disadvantage in the work that she did? I would say overall she used it to her advantage, and it could have been a disadvantage, but she refused to let it be a disadvantage. She had a rule wherever she went on the battlefield, she would not allow any Marine or any soldier to help her. She took the backpack, she marched with them, she lived in the horrible hovels, etc. Um, and as the only journalist who was trained to jump, which was her hobby when she was a teenager, she jumped with the 173rd Airborne in the, into a combat zone with those incredible uh, parachute on, three cameras around her neck. The, heavens knows they should have been flying in her face, but she jumped into a combat zone taking pictures. Isn't that what this is recording? This was after yeah. her jump that she was recognized for the jump by yeah, one, yeah, one they, of the um, officers. Yeah, that's one of her. That's her, and that's for. Look at how small she is. And she she is that size when she was in the middle of the battlefield. She would be on the ground. You wouldn't. Most of the people, most of the soldiers and marines wouldn't see her, and they would say, "I." That's impossible that anybody was that close to me. But she would crawl. She, she. Uh, some of the later uh, photography his, historians of photography marveled at the different um, angles she got when she was taking these pictures. 
because she could be she could get do, out and, yeah. Yeah, she was you know, so she, she could fit in into places right. without she, amazing. being seen. Uh, uh, how did the fact that she was French affect the work that she was able to do? Uh, on the one hand, she spoke the language of the elite in Vietnam. Mm-hmm. As on the other hand, she represented the former colonizer. So, did that again help and hurt in some ways? Well, um, French was much more common than just the elite then. It was. A, you know, it was it was middle class professional, so that that definitely helped. It helped in the sense she grew up thinking and knowing and talking about Indochina, Vietnam, so she was familiar with it. It was not just exotica the way it was with the Americans. Um, she learned her English from the Marines, and it was hideously, of course. Uh, but it's, I think, in a way, Katrine helped France because as. Um, as a very successful photojournalist, she's one of the um, photojournalists who helped make Paris the center of photojournalism in the 60s, 70s, and into the 80s. So in some ways, she was a help to, to Paris. You wrote that she set a record for the number of military operations covered by a journalist in 1966. Explain the kind of tasks she took on for herself and what kind of work she produced. She... Um, she made it a point to spend an awful lot of time in the field. Now, she joked she did it because she couldn't afford a good um, apartment back in Saigon, but, I mean, she wanted to get everything. So she had, she was with um, the combatants when they were um, in the middle of a firefight. She was with them when they were um, praying with a visiting chaplain. She was with them when they were disappointed that they didn't get any mail. She was with them when they found, found the dogs. She, she was with them every moment, and it showed in the respect they had for her because she, she was telling their whole story, not just what happens when they were in battle. So you, you, the most famous example of that is um, from the, ba- the Hills battle, and she was crawling in the middle of a ridiculously dangerous operation. And she... It, it looks, you know, like a desolate moonscape. And she captures a medic, a, a marine medic named Vernon Wickey, as he's trying to um, revive an, uh, a marine who dies. And he looks up in anguish. She has click, 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 click. She gets all that. And she gets him as anguish, anger, and then tears. And click, 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 click. Th- those photographs were everywhere. Look, life. Um, it was amazing. and We were um, delighted to find in our archives that she gave us an interview way back in 1985 where she talks about that particular uh, piece of work and okay. uh, also her career. We're just going to show a little bit of so people can see her and hear her in her own words. Great, thank you. Marine became very famous and he made me also very famous. His name is Vernon Weick. Uh, after I took this series of photographs, uh, a number of mothers uh, um, in America were absolutely convinced it was their son and I had to come back to this company a few days later and um, get his name and, and, and identified him. Um, it was uh, salt on the hill and he was uh, bending over his dead comrade and, and picked up his rifle and just so started to assault the hill screaming, I kill them all, I kill, I kill them all. And it was a very... Uh, it was one of the many stories I did there, but uh, that story was particularly uh, strong and had a very big impact on on uh, people who saw photograph and who were used to see images of, of the war. She says that it, it made her famous. What yes. happened to her career after these series of photos? Uh, well, she gets the George Polk Award. Um, she is um, She has commissions all over the place, and going from grubbing around. At one point, she was so poor, she had to um, get in what she thought was a student hostel, but it turned out to be a brothel. Uh, she Now she could afford what she most needed, a good good um, uh, cameras. She bought cameras, she bought equipment. Remember, she's a freelancer. Everything she has to supply herself. Um, and um, going very well, and then because it's war, she gets injured. And um, I, I have to say that one of her greatest, the greatest heroes of this book is a guy named Horst Foss. 
head of photography for Associated Press in Saigon forever, German himself, uh, a Pulitzer Prize winning photographer, he made sure she was cared for, that AP took care of her, and um, uh, it was just stunning. Then, then there's the way, the, the uh, operation of um, uh, the, the Tet Offensive, and she goes to Way and becomes the only journalist, male, female photographer or writer who crosses over during the operation in any time in the war and um, is captured by the North Vietnamese in Way, takes their photographs, recrosses, and then covers the, the rest of the, um, uh, the attack in Way from the American South Vietnamese side. She's extraordinary. And we, we have to underscore how dangerous, you said she was oh. injured, how dangerous this work was. Oh, unbelievable. She had scrapnel in her the rest of her life. Um, PTSD was not as yet something that we even understood, and much less for soldiers, much less for um, journalists, but both she and Kate were ser- had serious traumatic. And, and I, write, I write about how she talks about the trauma in sort of a very poetic, poetic way. In fact, that's my French quote on the cover of her. Let's move to Kate Webb. Um, What was really impactful about Kate Webb was her early life before she came to the battlefield, Uh, the tragedies that she suffered. How did they affect her, and were they the reason that she wanted to get away from her life? Well, in the instances of all three women, there there were reasons why they rebelled and wanted to come in. And Kate's was the darker one, absolutely. And, and, um, the, the, she witnessed her friend's suicide. And not only did she witness it, she had given her the rifle she used to kill herself. As a teenager. As a teenager in Australia, um, she was briefly charged with homicide. When her father testified, um, he fainted on the stand saying, you know, this was, this is a horrible tragedy, but Kate did not think she would kill her. You know, these are 15 year olds. The family, she's, the charges are dropped. The family somehow helps. God, the, the, what the treatment was was to have an Episcopalian nun come and help her learn how to sew. That was not exactly the best. But she, she gets to college. She's doing okay. And then both of her parents die in a car, car accident. So she's orphaned. And how old was she when she left Australia and came to Vietnam? 25. And you said that she had no real assignment when she got there. So None. how did she establish herself? Um, you, you sort of grub around. She, um, she found the one woman editor in all of, Saiga, in all of Vietnam, foreign editor, an American named Anne Mariano. And Anne was running an alternative newspaper for GIs. And Anne gave her press credentials and started to help her get... Uh, little assignments and pretty soon the wire services realized that this was an incredibly good bargain this Kate Webb young woman and um, they gave her hometowners so like the Omaha paper wanted can you do something on this unit from Nebraska and so pretty soon she was doing whatever came her way and she not only was doing it she was teaching them how smart she was and how good she was she was also fluent in French all three women spoke French, which was very important. So they eventually used her to even cover Cambodia before they hired her. So. But she made no money in your telling of the story. No. Uh, uh, you describe it as a hungry, shoestring life. Yes. And, uh, she, she ate street food, questionable street food. Right. Why wasn't she paid better? Oh, no one was paid. Uh, freelancers, we all went through this, this stage. Um, you learn to live on, on coffee and soup and street food and cigarettes. And then um, if someone asked you to dinner, of course you went to dinner. And then they paid. Um, you, you did it. That's, you know, it's, um, I don't think we expected comfort at all. And certainly not Kate. Kate, um, for her whole life, she would get a paycheck and forget to cash it. She lived... It was, she lived bare bones. We have Kate Webb talking about a different stage. Uh, this is when she was being, uh, was being assigned as the UPA bureau chief in Cambodia, so it's oh, a good. little later along. But again, I want to just let people see her and hear what she sounded like. Let's watch. UPI was, um, I think, very enlightened at that time, uh, vis-a-vis women. Probably my biggest problem was being non-American, but... On the other hand, I spoke French, so I had a big advantage. 
I think the toughest thing for me was as bureau chief, and I'm sure many people here in the audience know what it's like to make a decision to send somebody into a battle or up a road knowing they mightn't come back, uh, knowing you might have to write a letter to the family, knowing that you've got to live with the decisions you've made, and I had to do that, and I lost people. As bureau chief, I stepped into a dead man's boots. Cambodia was a heavy cost on journalists. <coughs> What more should we know about her story of coming? Oh my gosh, country? that just makes me so sad. Um, well, Kate, after she did so well in, in Vietnam, she was n made first deputy and then bureau chief, as she just said, in Cambodia. And as she said, it was very dangerous. In the first four months of Cambodia, more as many journalists were killed in that space of time in that country as had been killed in the previous six years, six years in Vietnam. And it was horrible. Um, <clears throat> and finally, Kate's luck ran out. And a year after she was named the bureau chief, she was captured. And she was captured and held for 23 days. During that period, see, Kate's Webb's byline by then was known. There were not many female bylines, much less female bylines, doing all the combat reporting she was doing, and it, doing it so well. So that when she was captured, it was a big deal. She was hardly the first nor the last, but it was a big deal. And um, during her time in captivity, there was an erroneous report that she had been killed and that the corpse had been found. So there were memorial services back home. Her obituary was published in the New York Times, and then she is released. And that's, I write, that's when the legend of Kate Webb sure. <laughs> blossoms. Uh -huh. And um, in her youth, I mean, she, we all aged, if you could have seen her with her, her almost Princess Diana haircut, her sparkle, her um, knowing that she was alive, she'd recovered, the whole world went crazy. How strange to read your own obituary. Right? Yes, and the, 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 the dark side of her story that you write about throughout the book is that she responded to what she saw by drinking a lot. Yes. How did alcohol, if at all, affect her work, her life? Well, she was um, a functional alcoholic. Um, I, um, I spent a lot of time with her sister, um, Rachel, and her brother, Jeremy, and we talked about it, and she refused to uh, seek any help. And, um, and I now, you know, after reading all the material, I know this is classic because there was underneath it was a lot of shame and guilt. So she continued to do remarkable work until she retires. Um, but she dies quite young, in her early uh, 61, I believe, um, of cancer, and she did not take care of herself. Um, and, you know, she continued to smoke. Um, we were, during the war, we all smoked, but most of us quit afterwards. But but just kept kept going, and um, it's this. You could do a whole study of PTSD looking at Kate's Web, Kate Webb's life. It was just stunning. But time to move on to Frankie F yes. Francis Fitzgerald. Uh, you referenced that her background was very different from these two women; that she came from wealth, but that wealth was really extraordinary. Yes. What was her early life like? She. Um, she was surrounded by servants. A chauffeur drove her to her private school when she was living in England. And then she moves to New York City where she has, you know, horses in stables in Long Island. She's, she, she's a great Gatsby kind of character. Um, and it's not new. It's wealth that's also part of a very patrician Mayflower kind of um, family. Very pure, you know, we work hard, but we also have this amazing life. The parents were elites. Her parents divorced early, and her mother remarried into great wealth, uh, Marshall Field um, Department Store, and um, money. And um, her dad was the head, was number three at CIA. I mean, she was gilded, gilded. How, how does a young woman from a background like this find herself as a war correspondent in Vietnam? Exactly. Um, and she was. She was. It was. She arrives because she, she was, first of all, extremely smart, very precocious. Uh, her juvenilia, I read all of her stuff. I, I couldn't believe that a 10-year-old was writing what I 
um, read in her diaries. She, um, she wanted to be a writer. She applied to Newsweek magazine after graduating with honors from Radcliffe, and they said, no, women are not qualified to be writers or reporters. They can only be researchers. So through her connections, she got to do some profiles for a newspaper, and, but that was it. You know, she, that was it. She was boxed. This was, she could have then married and led a glamorous life, but she fled that. I, she did not know what she was doing. None of the three really realized what they were doing. And she um, fled that, um, that golden cage and went to Vietnam and was, of all of the three, I think she was the most stunned. She had lived, I mean, she didn't even know what middle class was like, really. And she, you know, debutante and the whole thing. And here she was with people who were um, in, you know, an old, old, old culture, rural, not wealthy, and their country was being blown to smithereens. She just, and it was the most important story in the world. So that's how she got there. And, um, and she realized that the story had a, 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 the hooks in her like nothing had ever affected her before. You uh, wrote that she had her political awakening in Vietnam with the March 1966 Buddhist insurrection. Yes. How did that affect her, her view of what was happening? Well, she, this was the first time she could see the American war through um, Vietnamese eyes. And she saw that the Buddhists were, in a sense, the alternative political voice rather than the government something that she had not understood being an assiduous newspaper reader back home. So that's told her there was a lot more to the Vietnamese culture and society and and politics in with a small p not, not the parties so, of that she, that's what she would want to know. She wanted to know why these the Buddhists had to be um, put down by the government and what else was going on in the in the world of Vietnam that she didn't know about. And how did her, because she was writing, as you said, for magazines, so long mm-hmm. form, what was she able to do with long form journalism that photography or wire service reporting couldn't do? Oh, she, I was surprised. It's a good question because she, she did this life and death of a Vietnamese village for the New York Times magazine that you, you could run today almost. She, she, lived she lived the life now she had to have an interpreter but what would we would call in, invasive intrusive you know she would live the life of the vietnamese discover how they felt when their villages were being torn apart she would go and stay um, at length in a hospital to understand why corruption was ruining health care in the whole country. The same in Saigon. She didn't cover the fancy city. She went to the slums. So, and she wrote this in long form. So she did not, she could put all the nuances in and not just do a short so what paragraph. She would do, this is why the United States will lose this war. And uh, what, um, well, let, let's, let's listen to her, and we'll come back and talk a little bit more about her work. So this is from 1999. She's the only of, one of the three who's still with us. Yes. Uh, and she, this was from our archives once again, 1999, talking about the relationship between U.S. officials and journalists covering the war. There was this sort of uh, antagonism between reporters and the sort of higher officials, you know, all throughout the war, because, I mean, they were essentially trying to say we're, we're, we're doing fine, we're winning, um, but there's nothing going wrong at all. Um, uh, and, uh, therefore you, you know, you, you found that you had to examine those, uh, every single statement that was made practically to see whether it was really the case or not. It made reporting very difficult. I tell you, um, you kept having to go to the Delta to find out whether what they were saying about it was so or not. This antagonism, um, created a, a, uh, perhaps more of a, more of a sense that, you know, that reporters were on one side or another, whereas I don't think they really were. They were just trying to, trying to do their job. But she brought to her reporting those familial connections that you talked about, her, her father having been a top official in the CIA and the like. So she understood the relationship between po- politicians and the military. Did that affect her work? Yes, because, um, well, one, she realized that she was not going to um, spend too much time um, 
reading the tea leaves of, of the, the politicians. She just said she's going to go out and see what's really going on. She, and she had the confidence. When you grow up among the elite and her uh, going to her parents' cocktail parties where she hears them, she talks to them, she knows who's debating what. Her mother, her mother had been the um, very open lover of Adlai Stevenson, the former um, candidate for president. She was not buffaloed by this. So she could see, as she just showed you, she could see what was questionable, and she would go out and um, find the answers. And she very confidently then wrote it up, and voila. How much uh, impact did her, her work do on the politics of the war back at home? And did it affect the debate, the work that she was doing? Oh, yes. Um, very quickly, she became um, a favorite of people who were opposed to the war. And she went out of her way to make sure that people realized that she herself was not an anti-war person. She was a person who was trying to show how the Americans were losing and why. And um, in fact, when her book won all of the awards, Fire in the Lake won the Pulitzer, the National Book Award, the Bancroft Award, some of her... um, her more jealous colleagues said, oh, she only got the, all those awards and things because she's the favorite of the anti-war people. And she tried so hard to say, I'm, you know, if she eventually then, of course, you know, eventually she, um, she said, you know, we shouldn't have done it. But then in opinion pieces and things like that. But she was an influence. No question, she was an influence. In her chapters, there's a lot of famous names that come in and out. <laughs> Henry Kissinger, Daniel Ellsberg of the Pentagon Papers. Yeah. Uh, it, it, was it unusual that she had interactions with these sorts of people? Well, Daniel Ellsberg, no, because he was stationed there. And um, as she says, he's the only one who would take her seriously. Even her, her friends, in, one of her old childhood friends, uh, the diplomat Frank Wisner, was in the embassy. And they were friends, but he would not take her seriously as a as a reporter. But Ellsberg did, and and Ellsberg knew all the reporters. Henry Kissinger was probably you know just flirting with her, and um, and um, and she did, she had a name, Frances Fitzgerald. People knew where she came from, so there was that kind of vision too. That you know the attraction, and you know the first day you know she comes back to the United States. Reluctantly, knowing she had to leave the war because she was, it, it had gotten to be too much. And the first thing she does is go to the most famous party of the 20th century, practically Truman Capote's black and white ball. And the first person she sees is Defense Secretary Robert McNamara. So her life is Gatsby esque. If uh, one were to pick up Fire in the Lake today, is it still a worthwhile read? Yes. I mean, um, there's so much archival work that has been done since then that that it is dated there's no question and Frankie herself said that she would not write the the same book but it's a classic and you would read it and say in 1972 this was an extraordinary book um i when i i asked that same question to uh the expert uh, Frederick Logaval at Harvard now who's considered you know Pulitzer prize winning um historian on Vietnam he said absolutely it's, one, it's on that short shelf, a classic. We have about 15 minutes left, and uh, this is really a story of four female reporters on scene <laughs> because it is your story as well. We have a photograph of you in Cambodia in 1974 that we'll put on the screen. Uh, you, uh, how did you get to Cambodia? Mm. <laughs> um, I was in graduate school, Asian studies. Uh, I'm... Signif- I'm, I'm enough younger than the other women that I was consciously following in their footsteps. So I was um, a student in Asian studies. I was a member of something called the Committee of Concerned Asian Scholars, where we, all of us, um, through uh, research and politics and of history, um, realized that we should not be in that war. So I, had, I came with... Um, with that mindset, but the reason I went was because I had um, a dust up with my um, my my thesis, my master's thesis, who um, decided I should have an affair with him. And when he rejected my thesis because I didn't, he said that was not the reason. So I said, "Hmm, I'm not sticking around here. I'm not going to try to 
figure out how to get around this man. So I took my fellowship money and bought a one-way ticket to Phnom Penh. It's not as um, crazy as that sounds because when I was a student in India between undergraduate and graduate studies, I met a, a young woman named Silvana Foa who was also a student. And she was on her way to do graduate work in Hong Kong. Along the way, she somehow got to Saigon and decided that she would try to be a freelance reporter. And she um, uh, put off graduate studies. Ended up in Phnom Penh, where she met Kate, and um, started writing to me back in Seattle, um, saying, you've got to come here, you've put aside graduate studies for now, this is really important, come and be a reporter with me. And I had ignored it until I had that dust up with my, my thesis advisor, and then I said, okay, I will try it. And you met Kate Webb when you landed. Not only did I meet her, but Silvana arranged for Kate to meet me in Hong Kong. I was flying from Seattle, and in those days it took forever compared to now, and um, Kate met me at the airport, and it was like you know, seeing a legend. She'd already been um, released from her captivity. She'd been working in Hong Kong, and she got me through all the um, formalities and took me to dim sum lunch um, and made sure the next day I was on the airport to Phnom Penh, on the airplane to Phnom Penh. And um, in my backpack was the book Fire in the Lake. So I knew, <laughs> I knew and I foolishly thought, oh, the, if these two can do it, there must be lots of women, but there weren't. And what was your experience like? How dangerous was the work for you? Oh, um, it's, I think this is one of the reasons I had so much admiration for these women, because I had no idea what I was doing. And um, the first, the first, um, the first uh, war that, you know, you're covering, you're not covering, you're shaking, um, I saw atrocities, uh, young, young kids dying, um, soldiers shooting. Um, it was like g walking out your door and then turning the corner and there's war. I mean, this is, when countries are at war, it's not like your battlefields in, um, in their movies. And um, it got, and the war got closer and closer. Cambodia um, was a country that had been neutral through most of the war from 55 to 1970. So when the war, the American invasion and then the North Vietnamese expansion creating this um, battlefield, the Cambodians were unprepared and it was a slaughter. So by the time I got there, the Khmer Rouge, who were the communists, um, were, were taking advantage of this and, and looked like they were going to win. So I covered and witnessed um, the the um, the carpet bombing of Cambodia and um, that was um, it, nothing could prepare you for that and I'm covering Cambodia where these people don't know what an airplane are and the the fire falls from the sky and it and they think it maybe is the 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 mystical bird Garuda um, they their lives are ruined by a mis fire and, and there are mortars and the, the, the river is blocked there's no supplies, people flooding into the city and the beautiful city of Phnom Penh starts to um, look more and more like a refugee camp so it was very dangerous yeah, and there's a harrowing story of, of you and team members uh, who uh, were uh, survived an assassination attempt and one member of your team was killed in, in uh, as you went back to cover the end of Pol Pot's regime. Right. Um, I, w our time is limited, so I, I, I don't, I'll invite people to read it in the book uh, because it's, again, an, an, a, an example of the danger that all four of you exposed yourself to in covering this war. The question is, all of, all of you wanted to be on the scene as the war ended. Why do you think it drew everyone back to see how this war culminated for America? Well, um... It's, you're covering a country, not a war in a way. You, um, you have, war is an incredible surrender. You surrender yourself, you surrender your life to covering it. And once you do that, you, you, it doesn't leave you. 
So um, when Kate was in, a, was in Hong Kong, she, she pleaded with her bosses to let her to go to cover the evacuation. Frankie got a rare visa to Hanoi, and she was in Hanoi when the, um, thing, when the final offensive began. Katrine was off in the Middle East, and she got a f- flight to Paris and then to Saigon. She was going to see the end of it. Because it's not a story, per se. It's, it, it, as any war w- reporter will tell you, it's, as I said, it's, it's your life. And um, their dedication, I think, showed, uh, shows up. You, if you read their copy, look at their photographs, you would not be surprised. The dedication is in the seriousness, the uh, humanity of all the work they did. And, um, and everybody uh, had a hard time going back to real life. Did you, as a journalist, feel a special kinship with the American service people of that period? I didn't cover the Americans mm-hmm. because... Um, it was an air campaign by that point, right? It was, yeah, because the um, Congress was furious with the invasion of 1970. Remember, that was the biggest um, demonstrations across the country ever before or since. And Congress said, no, you cannot have the American military there for very long. So the American military was sent out. And so my... It was the guys on the sky. So um, that was even harder, that the that the that the that the bombs were your bombs, and um, that was difficult, very difficult. What propelled you to finally tell this story? Um, we're getting old. I was afraid. I mean, there there are a couple of attempts at books, but um, I felt I had to tell this story in a strong narrative that people would want to read. Because they've been, they're, 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 their story's lost. Their legacy has been forgotten. People all know Martha Gellhorn from World War II. They know um, Christiane Amanpour from the Gulf War. I would ask around, women photographers had never heard of Catherine Lois. And if they had heard of Frankie, they thought, oh yeah, she wrote a book, but she didn't cover the war, did she? And Kate Webb is even not well known in her home country of Australia. So I thought... This is the piece that's missing. These are the women who, and they're they're female colleagues, these are the women who really, they're the ones who are the modern link. They're the ones who broke through the thickest glass ceilings, and they're the ones who changed how things were seen. And, um, you know, the advantage of having been following with them, I knew... I knew their story, more or less. I knew where to look for all the stuff. And, and then I could read it. And I was afraid if, if it wasn't told by one of us, um, it wouldn't quite be what I would want. So there's a verisimilitude that I think I, I brought to the book. But, I, you know, I admire them crazy. What was the experience like for you of digging back into the archives and reliving this period of your, of your life as well? Um, it was much better than I expected. I mean, I learned so much. I was so surprised by the complexity, um, the thoughtfulness, the ups, the downs. I mean, I, I, I didn't mind writing about them when they were crazy. And I didn't mind saying that Catherine Lois kept shooting herself in the foot because that made this, the story was even more powerful than I could have imagined. And so... Um, I guess it helped me, too. I mean, I'm, I feel much more comfortable with my story. Uh, some of the reaction to, in both reviews and on social media to your book uh, uh, from women journalists who are foreign correspondents have written things like, things really haven't changed all that much. <laughs> Does that surprise you? Um, it doesn't surprise me. Um, I wonder if all of them who say that um, have read the book because they, it, things have changed a lot. Um, have, have, does it take more than a few generations to change attitudes? Yes. Does it take more than a few generations to change institutes, institutions? Yes. But, um, but there is change. And there's always change, backlash, change, backlash. And we might be in one of those backlash periods. You alluded to this earlier in the conversation, uh, but there was a whole generation of uh, 
post-Vietnam generals, analysts, and the like, and the lessons of Vietnam seem to inform policy going forward. But you alluded to the parallels between not knowing the country in Vietnam and what, what American policy has been like in Afghanistan and Iraq. Where do you see those um, lessons that haven't been applied about how important it is to know a culture? Well, look at how the Iraq war was um, voted on. It was supposedly a, a post-9-11 reaction. The information was, not, was false for the reasons for going in. Their understanding of Iraq was thin. And, um, and then once there, the mistakes were extraordinary, right off the bat. I mean, I was at the Times at the point. And we, it was so hard to cover that because you keep thinking, have they, I mean, it, my, myself, I said, haven't they learned anything from Vietnam? And then Afghanistan, I, I'm, I'm not an expert, but um, again, it's military might missing opportunities, military opportunities, and not knowing how to respond. I, so if overall it seems we still lead with the military and not with diplomacy, not with the understanding, and just, I mean, look at the difference in the budgets. Let's, <laughs> I mean, we're, we, we continually build up the military budget and we, are, um, we starve um, the State Department and USAID and so on and so forth. So I think we've lost the balance here. Is that a, a compelling reason to look back and understand stories like this from Vietnam? Well, if you say so. <laughs> well, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I, I guess, guess the question know. is why after 45 years should people read this? Why? Oh, yeah. B- yes. No, thank you. Um, yes, because this does, you read this and you say, oh, now I understand a little bit why we have our forever wars. I mean, it, 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 we not only, so we lost, and not, this is the first war we lost. And still today, it's hard for the Pentagon to say that we lost in Vietnam. There's all kinds of, there are libraries of books about why we didn't really lose. Um, we did not recognize Vietnam until 1990, after 1992, I can't remember the exact year, but we had, we just did not want to have to deal with it. And that's, um, that's so small. Um, uh, it's, uh, we're a bigger country than that. The book is called You Don't Belong Here, How Three Women Rewrote the Story of the War. Elizabeth Becker, thank you for spending an hour with C-SPAN to tell us these three women's stories and your own. Thank you, Susan, for having me in person. (laughs) Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Q&A. And subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts so you'll never miss an episode. And while you're there, please take a minute to rate and review us. You can also send us an email about Q&A at podcasts at c-span.org. Send me your questions, your comments, or ideas. Your feedback is welcome.